morning. Glad to be here with you. Let's go ahead and pray again. Lord, I thank you for this time this morning. I thank you, Lord, for everybody that is with us, Lord, uh, online. I thank you, Father, uh, that we get to study your word this morning, that we get to hear from you. Lord, I thank you for what an awesome and loving God you are, what a powerful God you are. Lord, I thank you for, for creating a place, Lord, for us to spend eternity with you. I thank you for wanting us, Lord, to spend eternity with you. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that it would draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray that it would increase our faith, Father. Lord, that it would increase our confidence in you, Father. Lord, I pray that we'd be living less for the world and more for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, I want to give a one quick uh, update just on the uh, meeting time. Thankfully, in Texas, we do have freedom now to uh, gather, but we still have a lot of guidelines that we're supposed to be following. We're trying to figure out exactly what is the best way to handle this and uh, and also figuring out when our building will be available again for uh, for rent. And so uh, we will be keeping you guys updated. You'll be looking uh, for updates hopefully through Facebook. We'll put them on our website once we have them and, uh, and also uh, through uh, text for the different people on the uh, Bible study text. We can send it out that way as well. Uh, so we'll keep you updated, and we'll hopefully put something out about middle of this week uh, for next weekend, and, and hopefully we'll have a, a, f- a few weeks out of, of the plan. Hopefully, uh, Lord willing, if things continue to improve with the virus, hopefully it won't be uh, more than, than a few weeks, uh, maybe to the end of the month before we are able to start getting back together. That's the hope. So, All right, we're going to be in John 14 this morning, but we're actually going to read before we do. I want to read Psalm chapter 84. If you want to turn there with me, Psalm chapter 84. Uh, it's not going to be up on the PowerPoint, and uh, but, but you're welcome to turn there. But I want to read this before we get into uh, John 14 this morning. So, Verse 1, it says, How lovely is your tabernacle or dwelling, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, or weeping, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold for those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blesses the man who trusts in you. What a great song. And, and, it, and it opens there just with, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, and even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out. We know that saying, right? From We, we sing that. And, and this heart, this longing uh, that we're catching here for, for dwelling with the Lord forever. And we also go on as he, in verse 5. Blesses the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. You know, I think this is so key for us, uh, for our text this morning, for our lives in general, and and the, even the way we're looking at this um, this pandemic and different things. Uh, first is, blessed the man whose strength is in you. Right? We should be getting our strength from the Lord, but also says, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. You know, that's one of the things the Lord told me when I when I was coming out um, to Dallas, right? When he told us that we were first me moving here, you know, a, a good year, year and a half uh, before we actually moved out here. And, and I remember in, on my knees when the Lord said, yes, this is where I'm taking you. And I said, oh, Lord, is this, this, so this is my new home. And he said, no, this is your next stop on your pilgrimage. Right? He was reminding me my home is with him for eternity. This life is a journey there. This is not my home. And, and we ought to remember that as believers, this life is a pilgrimage. And as, he, uh, as they pass through the Valley of Bacar, we're weeping. 
There's going to be hard times. There's going to be a hard season. But, but we should have our heart set on him, on the things to come, on eternity. It's a hard thing, I feel, for us to grasp. In, in some degree of our flesh, I don't think we actually expect to die. Or, or we, we push it off where it's such a distant thought. We're, we're not concerned about it. And I'm not in any way saying we should be living in a spirit of fear. I'm saying we should be living with a spirit of anticipation and joy of where we're going, living within the reality that we are on a temporary journey, but we're going to land in eternity. And we're going to get there sooner than we think. So as we're talking about that, uh, I, w- I want to throw out the question, do you believe that that which you believe is really real that's one of the things as we're, as we're oftentimes we can we can talk about uh things in the word of god we can talk about things with the end times we can talk about prophecy we can talk about how we should be spending this life but do we truly have confidence in the word of god do we really have confidence in, in the perspective of eternity and so i want that as a backdrop as we dive into john 14 this morning so jesus he finished up his uh his dinner with his uh disciples or or his um i guess probably still there and and he's having this conversation with them so verse one let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me you know uh just before this at the end of uh chapter 13 jesus told them where i'm going you cannot follow me uh, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And we oftentimes will look at that as suffering, but as we'll continue into chapter 14, not only would they follow in the suffering, but they'd follow in the glory. They'd be well with him for eternity in heaven. Uh, and so that following was not just a, a reference to the persecution they would endure, but was also to the, to the dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, so as we're reading right here, let not your heart be troubled. You know, God knows as he explained he knows the hour has come for his for his persecution the disciples i really don't think they're quite getting it yet i really don't there jesus is talking to them but it hasn't set in we see it i think in the conversation when we go to the garden jesus is telling them to pray they fall asleep i don't think they're quite getting that the hour is upon them uh, but jesus knew and jesus is telling them and, and he's also though even he's he's getting their hearts he's he's warning them let not your heart be troubled he says look i know guys when the when the time comes and i'm arrested and and taking to the courts you're going to be tempted and that tempting is going to be a fear uh, that's what this this trouble means it means trepidatious it means fear it means unrest of the mind it means imperfect it means something that takes away the calmness of mind makes you restless or strikes one's spirit with fear or dread that's what this word trouble means. let not your heart be troubled and that's what God has given us right here. You believe in God, believe also in me. So he's saying, look, when these things start happening, guys, don't become fearful. Have greater confidence in me. Have a greater confidence. I have told you these things. Uh, and have greater confidence in my ability to bring you through them and living within the perspective of eternity, not the temporary, not the immediate moment right before you. And he opens up this chapter with, uh, with the heart and a call to believe him. And we'll come back to that because he's going to hit on it in the chapter. And he's going to close with uh, that as well. And so he's calling us to have trust, which is to have confidence in him. right? Uh, to, to be sure of the things that he has told us. So verse 2, he goes on. He says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I love love this uh, passage. I love this encouragement he's given, and you've heard me say it before, right? But one of my favorite things about God is that he's personal. And he says as he goes, I go to prepare a place for you, for the bride. He's going to prepare a place for his bride. And I will come again. I think we see there with this the the hint of of the wedding. Right of of the um, uh, he's coming back for his bride. He is letting her know, I am coming for you. Have confidence. Trust me, that I I am coming for you, and I go to prepare a place for you. What an awesome 
God, that he is preparing a place for us to dwell with him. That where I am, there you may be also. He is bringing us to his home, to his own place. Many mansions is really uh, is probably just a reference to lots of room or lots of room, right? Uh, we, we I think in our minds we can think of uh, of you know these massive huge homes. Obviously he's a king. Yes, I'm sure his, his home is plenty large enough. But the the idea of what he's saying is is heaven's not going to run out of room. In my father's house are many mansions, many rooms, and so he's saying, look, you don't have to be afraid that it's going to get full before you get there. There is room and there is plenty of room. For all who place their faith in Christ. A few other things I want to note about what he's saying here uh, is it's in his father's house. Right? When he brings us to him, when he brings us to heaven, we're not just going to be with him. He brings us into his family. And he doesn't just bring us in in the sense even that he just calls his children. He brings us into his home to dwell with him. That, that picture that he's uh, painting here. And he's calling for us to believe, to have confidence, to have confidence matter what happens in this life great things are to come that's what he's calling us to hey look guys you know some hard times are going to hit and they're going to hit pretty soon for these guys it was going to hit that night some hard times are coming but he's reminding them listen I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back for you you cannot follow me now but you will follow me later it wasn't the disciples time to go yet right they were not ready yet that they had work still to be done but Jesus was going to prepare a place for him, and he's calling them to have confidence in him, confidence in the words that he is talking. In Revelation, we also uh, read about this. It says that there's no need for a sun, for the glory of God illuminates the city. When we get to heaven, the glory of God will illuminate the city. And as we just read in Psalms, as, as he's crying out there, he says, better is one day. We're, as we've sang uh, several times, better is one day with you lord than thousands elsewhere one day in your courts and so as we're looking at this we sing that song that's why I, why I asked that original question do you believe that that what you believe is really real because for eternity we won't get just one day we get forever with him and what an awesome gift that is and oftentimes we can get so worried or concerned about the things going on around us we lose perspective of the amazing promises we've already been given for eternity. Just trust in Jesus. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. We know the suffering was hard on Christ as we continue to read, even this night. It was an hour of, of trial for him. It was not an easy season this next uh, several days for the disciples. It was not an enjoyable time. But right now, those same disciples who became apostles, who God used mightily, are now in his house dwelling with him for all eternity. And they are now in his joy and in his rest, and the pain is no more. And their fruit continues, though their faithfulness is continuing to impact people like us still today. So verse 4, Jesus said, And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Referring to he's going to heaven, he's going to the Father, and the way is through him by faith. We'll get into that more as we go. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? You know, don't take for granted that you know the way, that you understand uh, this, this, this question that, that uh, Thomas says, or this, this response is, is one that I think is still common to people today. They, they, they claim this un, unknowing, and Thomas was not uh, unknowing because he was uneducated. He spent three years with Jesus. And here he's saying this, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And if you know where you're going this morning, if you know Jesus Christ, and you know because of Christ that you live, then thank God, because that, that is a tremendous gift. That understanding that you have is a blessing. And so don't take that for granted. Also, in life and through ministry, I also think God consistently calls us out of our comfort zones. And, and I think he becomes our comfort, actually, in those times. But we learn to trust in him and so with this i also just encourage you to have your confidence here he's saying we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way right and we need to have confidence as god is leading us if we don't understand all the details we trust him according to his promises for the outcome matthew chapter 7 
verse 14, Jesus said, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Right here is Thomas is saying we, he doesn't know the way. And remember, we know Thomas through this season was struggling uh, in his faith. And, and ultimately, he is a, a great brother in the Lord. They're, they're recorded, I think, a lot of ways for our encouragement, but also for us to have greater reason to trust what is written for us in the Word. But Jesus says, um, Difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. That end of that sentence there, you go look this up for yourself, that word, it. It is most commonly translated the word him. It's over uh, over 1,900 times, I believe, in the Bible that word is translated him. It's the most common rendering of the word. And I really believe what he's saying is difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find him. It's a reference. Either way, whether you look at it as the word it or him, it is a reference to Jesus, undoubtedly. And he is the way. And Thomas knew these teachings. Now, you may not understand all the exact specifics. That's okay. You may have questions, and, and some people are way more technical than others in their questions. It could be exactly how does it happen when you die? Do angels carry us there? Are we instantaneously? Is there a travel time? What is it like if, there, if we're outside of time? And there can be a lot of different questions. And we don't have to have every specific detail to know that if God has said, I'm going to come for you, and you will spend eternity with me, to have confidence, I don't know exactly the chain of events maybe that will take place when I pass from this life to the next, but I know that Christ knows and that he is able to accomplish his word to me. He is able to keep his word. He's faithful so I can have confidence in him. Uh, verse 6, Jesus said, you know, whenever we read that, I just as I was making a note right there, when we read that saying, Jesus said, that's a powerful statement. And it should really sink into our hearts when, when we're remembering what we're reading, the words of God Almighty. So Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's go ahead. Let's break that down a little bit more this morning. I am the way. All right, he's not a way. He's not a gate. He's not one of many paths. He is the way. Early Christians were even called followers of the way. Billions of people still today say Jesus was a great teacher but not divine and do not believe they need him for salvation or, or they change who Jesus was entirely, but they keep his name. And, and it's important for us to understand he is the way, not his ideology is the way, uh, not religion is the way. He's not even just the best way. No one comes to the Father except through him. So if you have not repented and placed your faith in Christ and become his follower, you're not saved. That's what he's saying. There's an only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. It's not believing he's just a good person. It's believing he's a great prophet that doesn't help you. He is the gate. He is the only way to the Father. He's the only way into heaven. How do you find that? How do you enter the gate? Well, he lays it out. Repent, which means turn to God. Uh, turn from, from your ways. To turn to God. Redemption. You must be covered by his blood. And then relationship, you enter into a relationship where you become sealed by the Holy Spirit and that he be dwells inside you. This isn't uh, a reference or saying that any specific spiritual gifting is required uh, to manifest from that, but merely represents that you have become his. You will see the spirit, the, the fruit of the spirit begin to dwell in you. But we're not necessarily, uh, as some would uh, try to argue, say, uh, for uh, evidence of spiritual gifting of different kinds. But the Spirit is most certainly dwells within the believer. If you have done these first two, right, if you have turned to God, if you have repented from your sins, you have placed your faith in Christ, uh, then you have entered into a relationship with God. And in that relationship, He's the Father. We're the kids to His house. He's not coming uh, to, to dwell with us for eternity. We're going to dwell with Him for eternity. And that's because He is superior to us. And that's also part of why we submit, because we agree that he is superior, that he is wiser, that he knows better than us. And so we follow confidently in faith. Next, Jesus said, I am the truth. And again, he said the truth, not a truth, not true for you, but not necessarily true for me. Uh, often in our times, I think we actually really think of truth as um, as objective in the sense that we can have different truths uh you you believe one thing to be true i believe another thing to be true 
And, and so we just have different truths. And, and that is, uh, of course, absurd. You cannot have different truths. One person is deceived and one is right. Jesus said, I am the truth. So if he is a good teacher this morning, if, if any of you are watching, if that is your view only of Jesus, he is a good teacher, then my encouragement to you is listen to what he is saying because he is saying, I am the way and I am the truth. He is a phenomenal teacher, Jesus is, but he is so much more than that. He is not partially true. He is not mostly true. He is the clearest, uh, cleanest definition of truth that the world has ever seen. And the speaker uh, isn't, I'm sorry, right there. Everything he speaks is truth. It's because of him and his will that everything exists. It is impossible for us to find a more absolute truth than the words, actions, or personage of Jesus Christ. And so he is the absolute truth. Lastly, in this sentence here, he says, I am the life. You know, death came from sin. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible tells us. But God is the creator, the sustainer and source behind life itself. Without God or without Jesus, there would be no life. So he is not just a superior life. And he is, a, he is not only the sustainer of spiritual things but he is the sustainer of all things things on earth and things in heaven all life flows from him and he sustains all of it in this world and in heaven and for out t- throughout time for all eternity he is the sustainer and the author of life so if you exist today physically it's because god created you that is why you're alive if you inherit eternal life it will only be because of the blood of jesus christ So all life comes back to Jesus. All of it comes back to God. So when he says here to to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is exactly what he means. That is exactly what he is telling us. He is saying that in a complete and in a powerful statement. There is no other way. He is the clearest definition of truth, and he is the only hope or creator of life. Verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Uh, from now on, uh, probably is referring from a here forward or from this time forward, you know him. Um, in other words, that they would begin to see the plan of God also unfold here with Christ. His, uh, his life, his death, his resurrection right here. And that they'd be walking uh, now in that understanding. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us father and it is sufficient for us jesus said to him have i been with you so long and yet you have not known me philip he who has seen me has seen the father so how can you say show us the father you know when i read this uh, this section the first thing that came to my mind lord forgive me all the time that i have uttered foolish thoughts before you if you've seen jesus you have the father If you have Jesus today, you have the Father. If you have encountered Jesus, you have encountered the Father. Jesus just sends out this powerful statement in verse 6. And already we see that the the disciples, again, they're having a hard time understanding what Jesus said at this time. But Jesus said, He has seen me, has seen the Father. He said that back in John uh, 10, or right here, but also back in John 10, He said, I and the Father are one. He had already been teaching his disciples that for for some time, but he's letting them know right there, me and the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen him. You can't have Jesus without the Father. You can't have the Father without Jesus. They're they're one in the same. And though they're revealed in different ways, though they have different roles, though there's a great mystery there within the Trinity, there is one God, and I and my Father, Jesus said, are one. What does that also mean? That also is letting us know if you don't have Jesus, if you have not come through him, then you, do, then you have not found the one true God. He is the only way that you can find the Father. Verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. You know, 
like I said, the, the, the previous section as I was reading, it, it was like, Lord, forgive me for the times I have uttered foolish thoughts before you. And as I get to verse 10, honestly, the first thing that hit me is, oh, Lord, I never want to hear those words. Do you not believe that I am? Wow. Do you not believe? You know, that's something I never want God to ask me, not with anything he ever tells me. Do we trust the words of God? Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Right? The, the Bible is true whether or not you accept it. God's word will not fail. It has never failed and never will fail. But when we read that, when we understand that, we should walk in tremendous confidence. And this, this is a sign. This is part of, you know, we know that our confidence, our believing, our trusting in God is not a small issue. It's a big issue because if we're not trusting in him, we're trusting in a lie. And so this is a big issue. But we also see this, this struggle, even within his disciples that were there, that witnessed the miracles themselves. They have seen Jesus raise the dead. They have seen him give sight to the blind. They have seen him confound the wise. And they have walked with him. And, and he's, they still get this, that the night before he's about to be crucified. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Do you not believe? And guys, it's so important that we guard our hearts, that we guard them because we are called to believe. In verse 11, he, call, he calls it again. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. I think this almost seems that the question maybe from Philip here to, to see the Father was probably somewhat hurtful uh, to Jesus. I could be wrong on that, but I think that's the way uh, it looks to me. Be, because that Philip was not getting who he was, who he was, and that he had already seen the Father. And in verse 11, he tells him here, believe or believe. Even if it's dis difficult for us to grasp, sometimes when we think about eternity, it can be difficult for us to grasp. It can be hard for us to wrap our heads around the next life. We can get so distracted also at the same time by the cares of this life, by the things in this world that we can lose sight of the big picture and take our eyes off of God. You know, we can get our eyes on so many things in the world. It's not just sin. Sometimes we are distracted with sin. If we're distracted with sin, we absolutely need to repent. But we also can make things sin that even are, are not necessarily sinful because we give them our hearts, we give them our time, and we pursue them with our lives. It could be finances, it could be titles, it could be careers, it could be relationships, it could be status. It could be so many different things. But we need to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. We need to be believing the words that he said and not lose sight of the big picture. It's so easy to get focused on the problems. I think we see that a lot right now. You can't turn on the news and get away from the virus. You can't uh, hardly get in conversations. Even church now, you're hearing about it. Right, And we see that we're, we're easily distracted and we're caught up right here in this moment. But there's a much bigger picture. There's a much bigger picture that he's calling for us to and to, for us to walk confidently in him that even if we encounter a hard time, even if we go through the valley of weeping, that Christ will bring us through. We just need to keep our eyes on him because better things are awaiting us. Those who trust in him, those who are faithful to the end. Verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. You know, as we read this first, this promise here, this is an amazing promise, but he says, uh, it's to those who believe in Jesus. So those who believe will do greater works. This seems really hard to imagine, right? We've already gone through some of the miracles this morning, but raising the dead, healing the sick, cleansing the leper, um, healing the blind, multiplying the fish and the bread, walking on water. Jesus did so many miracles, and we look at this and we go, what could be greater than that? And even some of us, we look and go, and who after this fulfilled this? Well, the apostles and the disciples filled this, uh, fulfilled this, and how did they do that? Because they preached the gospel. That's what they did. It's a greater work than raising someone physically from the dead. It's a greater work than healing the physical blind is preaching the gospel, preaching 
the Word of God. It is a, it is a tremendous gift and privilege that is given to the church and is far superior to any kind of temporary miracle. The, the Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead, guess what? His body, it still died again. The guy that was healed from the blind, guess what? He still died. Those who are fed by the loaves, guess what? They still needed to eat again. But those who find life, everlasting life, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the gospel, they live forever. And that message, that amazing message, has been entrusted to us. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The gospel is the most powerful message in the world, and God has given it to us. And so what should we do with it? We should share it. When you share the gospel, now it's still God who brings somebody from the dead. It's still by the power of Christ that they're, that they're redeemed, by the blood of Christ. But we get to bring that life to them by message of the gospel. And that is the greatest work. And so we should be excited and thrilled to do that. And, and again, remembering the reality. When you have the boldness, you go out and you share your faith with somebody and they respond in faith. You haven't changed just their temporary life. You've changed eternity. That person who was once an enemy of God will now inherit eternal life. That person who was dead in their sins will now live forever in Jesus Christ. That person who is going to be cast out into darkness will now do well as an heir in the house of God and know all his goodness. And this is a beautiful and this is a great work. Verse 13, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I believe really what he's saying is whatever tools you need for spreading the gospel, ask and I will give it. And, and with that, you know, I, I encourage us uh, to pray big with the gospel. For a local church, let's pray that God uses us to reach a lot of people. Uh, millions of people, billions of people. Pray big. Pray that God would allow us to reach more people than we could imagine. But pray also for people's hearts to respond. Pray for God to soften their hearts, to reveal himself to them. God enables his church to accomplish the task that he has given to them. And so we are not left alone. Verse 15, the reason we pursue righteousness, the reason we pursue godliness, the reason we act and walk different is because we love God. Not because we are saved by our righteous deeds. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is how we're saved. We, our response is to love him. That is how we are to respond to his amazing uh, gift of salvation. Love towards him and love towards our neighbors, those around us. John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered said, And this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. God wants us to have confidence, to trust in him. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, the Bible tells us we love him because he first loved us. And we are called in the Bible to walk worthy. We're told to let no unwholesome thing proceed out of our mouth. We're told to edify the body, to reach the lost, and to live godly lives with honesty and integrity. But above all, we're told to love God and love those around us, that that must be the motive and the heart behind it, all of it is obedience and love towards him. What that means for us, this should be our highest aim every day. Right? Every day, that should be our highest aim. How do I love God today? The definition of a, of a good day, of a successful day or a failed or a wasted day is really going down to, did you successfully love God that day or did you fail? Did you not express love? Did you not do any, anything of love? There's, there's plenty of ways to, uh, to express love to God. You can read 1 Corinthians 13 for one, but also you can think about even how we express love to other people. If things as simple as writing a letter, there's things that if you know that there are things that are hindering your relationship with them, of course you give those things up. There is spending personal time. That's a big one. Who do you love that you don't spend personal time with? Get on your knees. Be in the word and hear from him. Seek him. Listen and receive his words 
with faith, with confidence in them. Verse 16, And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. You know, this call, this call for loving God first, it's a high calling, and it's past us. We cannot ever measure up to, to keeping this to, to the way that he deserves, to the way that he has loved us. But thankfully, God has not left us alone in this calling to accomplish it by ourselves. He himself has come down, he has sent the Spirit of God to help us, to teach us, and to guide us. Isn't it awesome that Jesus prayed for us? Right? He prays for his disciples and he prays for the believers, for all believers. One other thing we should grab out of that is, is be like Jesus and intercede for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for them. As we also talked, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. You pray for yourself. Pray for your brother also. Pray for your sister in Christ. Pray for their kids. Pray for the salvation of the lost. Pray. Be an inter, uh, intercessor for others. Here he's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about a few things about this. Right? The first one, as we just already mentioned, is we need to remember it is a gift. It's an incredible gift. God himself to come and to dwell with us. Second, he will abide with us forever. What an awesome promise. Not for a short time, not for a season, not sometimes. He will abide with us forever. Third, he is called the spirit of truth. Fourth, the world cannot receive him, only those who have been made clean by the blood of Christ. Fifth, you know him. Right Again, he is not detached. It is personal. Have you ever been corrected by God? Have you ever been encouraged by God or received comfort from him? And Have you ever received direction or a rebuke? Right, These are evidences of the Spirit of God working in your life. There should be uh, things you can see where he says that at verse, uh, or the uh, point five there is you know him. Number six, and we'll, uh, and we'll be in you continually. Number seven, I will not leave you orphans. Number eight, I will come to you. You know, the Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, is the guarantee of our salvation. Uh, again, as we kind of opened up earlier, as he's talking about it, uh, he goes to his father's house to prepare a place for us. And, and there's that picture uh, of marriage that he's going to prepare a place for his bride. But this is also his, uh, the in a sense, the, the Holy Spirit is, is like the engagement ring that he has given to the church. The promise that I am coming back for you. The guarantee that you belong to me and that I'm coming for you. And so the Spirit is also given that we may know that we belong to Him. And we should walk in tremendous confidence with this, that I will come to you. Verse 19, he said, A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will live as I live, and you will live also. Right? Jesus was not staying around in the flesh. He intended to ascend back to heaven. We still uh, see Christ obviously working even in our own lives. Uh, I usually just think of John 3 when he talks about uh, but with the wind there in Nicodemus. You can go read about that, but it's, it's similar for what he's talking about here. But, he, but this statement right here that he closes with, because I live, you will live also. What a wonderful statement that is. Why am I going to heaven? Because of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has risen and conquered sin and death and paid my debt. He has set me free, and because he lives, I live. And this is why we should have such tremendous confidence. He has demonstrated his power over sin and death. Verse 20. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So God is one. If we have the Spirit, we have Jesus and the Father. And he bears witness with our spirit that he is God, and that he dwells in those who belong to him. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you have heard, which you hear, is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So he said, we will come and make our home, 
or our boat or our dwelling place with him. Who will, who will he do that for? He who loves him. He who loves Jesus. The one who loves Jesus, who's striving after him or is, uh, is uh, conforming his life to the will of Christ. Removing the things in his life that separate him from Jesus and striving after those things that please him that he might draw closer to him. Who is he who loves him? He who is forgiven little loves little. He forgiven much loves much. The one that loves Jesus will come to him and make our home with him. That's the mark of the believer, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is the manifestation of the relationship we have with God. That's why the gospel, if you've heard me say, I tell you, it goes repentance, redemption, relationship, right? Where you repent, you, uh, you turn from your sinful ways and you turn to God. You uh, place your faith and become covered by the blood of Christ and then you become sealed by the Holy Spirit. So it, whether or not anybody ever knows it, those are always the steps of the gospel. That's, that's the side, that's from, from man, how we go through those steps. He who does not love me does not keep words. That's a strong statement. Strong statement. He does not love me. This is not an issue of stumbling. This is uh, evident by the disciples we see sitting right here. We see a difference between Judas and the different disciples. Um, we know that Jesus did not accept the works of the Pharisees. So he is not just calling us to try to strive to keep the law in a physical sense. It's an issue of the heart. If we love him, we should strive after him. And that's really what it's talking about. Uh, how could you come to the understanding that Christ paid for your sins? How could you understand that? That God himself stepped off his throne, became a man, lived without sin, and died in your place, and now has offered you everlasting life, and not just everlasting life, but has gone to prepare a place for you to spend eternity in his home as his child forever. And how could you not love him if you know that? How could you not respond in love? And so if we love him, we should do the things that are important to him. Starting with walking with him personally. Starting with trusting in him. Starting with believing the things that he has written for us. Uh, when we apply the word of God, we shouldn't do it begrudgingly. We should do it because we're confident that the things God has called us to are better than the things that we would do of ourselves. Because we have a confidence in our king. That we're ready and willing to, fo to follow knowing that his plans are better than our plans even if it goes through the valley of pain or of weeping. Verse 25, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Aren't you so thankful that God gave us the Holy Spirit? I am so thankful for that. I couldn't even imagine trying to navigate the life, uh, life or the Word of God apart from the Spirit of God. And so thank you, Jesus, Thank you, God, for this amazing gift. It says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things. And we should be studying the Word, God. We should be faithful and diligent to be in it and, and trying to increase our understanding of it. But the deepest truths, the ultimate understanding, the greatest applications, they are gifts from God. They are God teaching us and revealing to us His own written Word. And, and so pray also as you study and ask God, ask the Spirit to give you wisdom, to give you understanding. Uh, he tells us if we come, if any of you lacks wisdom, uh, let, him, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God. And as we read the Word of God, we should ask him, Lord, help me, help me to understand. And not only will he help us to understand, he will help bring to remembrance the things that he said. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to my Father, for my Father is greater than I. The peace of God, what a great gift this is. Have you known that peace? I believe it's best experienced in his presence on your knees, kneeling before him, crying out or giving praise. I think that is the times I've experienced the greatest peace of God. But again, he tells us not to be troubled, not to be trepidatious, not to be fearful or of an unrest mind. Not one who has fear or dread. 
not one who's imperfect in their thoughts, one that is trusting in God. He opens this section with a call to faith, and he closes this section with a call to faith. He opens this section with a, with a call to not let your heart be troubled, and he closes it the same way. You know, this was a really hard season that was about to hit for the disciples right here. And it would go fast. It would come on them suddenly. It was like a zero to 60. Um, Jesus is counseling them, do not fear. Trust me in the storm. Guard your hearts, right? That, that he's given us warning. Keep your eyes on Jesus because then in a matter of moments, their entire world changed. Here they are, disciples, disciples, disciples. Boom, here comes the crucifixion. Some really hard season, a few days in there. Christ is resurrected. He restores them. Now he sends them out as apostles. And, and it's a, a massive transformation. I don't think they were expecting it at all. Uh, and so life can change instantly, but we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and on the promises that he's given. And, and as he told them, I have told you these things beforehand so that you may believe. Verse 29, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. You know, there is a spiritual battle uh, that was going on during this time, and Satan was about to be defeated. I think Satan right now is probably expecting his greatest victory as he's about to uh, take the, try to take uh, Jesus uh, if, and lay out his plan to try to crucify him, uh, which I think he thinks is going beautifully, but low does he know that it is also God's plan, that he is not a, um, a powerless victim or one that is struggling against, but that he was a willful sacrifice to pay for our sin. And I think right here we see as Satan goes and he's thinking he's going to have his greatest victory, we see the glory of God and we see when God steps into the fight, that Satan is powerless against him. And so one thing I want to grab from that is, as he's talking about that Satan and Jesus are not stuck back and forth in a cosmic battle. Satan is a criminal, and Jesus will judge and condemn him as one. Jesus is the king of kings, the creator of all things. Satan is a created being that has fallen from God, and he will be judged. And so we re need to remember the different places of each of them. And, and do not fear the enemy, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Verse 29, And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Again, this call for us to believe. And that this is a large issue with God, that we believe him and that we do not believe the lies of Satan. So do you trust in God's promises or do you doubt? Do you stand on his word confidently or are you easily shaken? Do you trust that he's prepared a place for you to spend eternity with him? You know, I think, again, we look at all these things going around the world right now uh, with, the, with this virus and the way people are responding. Some people are angry. Some people are scared. Some people are confused or nervous, uneasy, uncertain of the future. Some people are, are worried. Some of them are over health, others over economics, others if society will ever return to how it was. All these different things people are worried about. Yet the Bible tells us at the end of times, things will get much worse. So where is your confidence? Where is our confidence? Are we keeping our eyes and our perspective right? Are we keeping our fix on Jesus? You know, and as we begin to see some of these uh, signs unfold more and more of his returns, or we see the stage set more and more. You know, is this coronavirus, is it a, uh, is it a beginning of, uh, or a birth pain? It could be, maybe, maybe not. But either way, we see that the stage most certainly is becoming more and more set for the things that God has written to come in the end. Where we're going, wow, these, these are becoming more and more set in our time. Uh, and the stage is most certainly uh, being unraveled before us. As we begin to see these things, we know that hard things come in the end times. But where will our confidence be? Will we become greater uh, in our faith, or will we, will we cower in fear? Will we, will we uh, be troubled in our hearts, in our minds? Or will we look for with joy because we know our redemption draws near? Because those signs mean that, that Jesus is coming soon. As he says this, I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. 
You know, I think about that, and I think maybe Jesus would say the same things for us today, is when you see the stage begin to be set, and it starts to, and you start to see the things at the end, don't be troubled. I've told you before it comes that you may believe, that you may know that this is how it will unfold, and that my servants may not walk in fear, but in confidence in me. Not confidence of ourselves, not confidence nothing bad will happen to us, but confidence because we know our, secu- our, our eternity is secure in Christ. Because we know we're living for a better time. And so however these lives unfold, if we keep our faith in Christ, if we endure to the end and we're faithful, if we keep our eyes on Him, we will inherit better things. We will dwell with Him for eternity. Amen? So let's be of those who believe. Let's guard our hearts And let's not be distracted by the things of the world, but let's walk confidently in the things that he has spoken for us and the things that he has done. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for everybody that has joined us, Lord. Lord, as we get ready to close this morning, Father, if if there's anybody watching that has not, Lord, placed their faith in you, if they have not come to know you as their Savior, if they have not been sealed by your Holy Spirit, if they have not come into that relationship, Father, Lord, I pray that this morning would be the time Lord, I pray that they would turn from their evil ways, that they would turn to you and they'd cry out, Lord, please save me. And Lord, that they would enter into that relationship with you that lasts for eternity, Lord. Lord, that they'd have the joy of knowing that you've gone to prepare a place for them. Lord, that they would not have the fearful expectation of standing before you as a guilty sinner, Lord, to be condemned for their sins, to be cast out, Lord, in outer darkness. But Lord, that by your grace and by your mercy, Lord, because of what you've done, Lord, that they would receive your offer by faith, Lord, and become a child of God. If that's you this morning, I encourage you to cry out to him, to say that to him. Just say a simple prayer. Lord, I see my sin. I need your salvation. Save me. Forgive me, Lord. I trust in you. I believe in what you have done, your death and resurrection. Come dwell in me. I want to follow you. I want to know you. I need you, Lord. Cry out to him for salvation. And have confidence in what he's done. Lord, for us who know you, Lord, that we'd have confidence in your word. That we'd have such trust, Lord, as we read it. As we see things around us, Lord. That it would give us joy in our hearts to know, Father, that that your word is faithful, that it is true. And, Lord, that, that when you come, Father, that we'd be excited. Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd give us just that heart, that constant mind, Lord, where we trust in you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would increase our faith, Father. Lord, we love you and thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, that you've prepared a place for those who love you. And Lord, we look forward with great joy and expectation to being in your presence for eternity. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. I hope you have a great week. God bless.